everyone. My name is Cherry, and it's my pleasure to welcome our next So in our last panel discussion, we learned how challenging it is to tackle the plastic pollution problem. Our next keynote speaker, Diana Cohen, is a notable figure in addressing the pervasive problem of plastic pollution. She's the CEO and co-founder of Plastic Pollution Coalition, a global alliance of nearly 1,000 organizations, businesses, and thought leaders from 60 countries, working towards a world free of plastic pollution. Diana is an artist, activist, and public speaker. Through her art, she explores plastic as a material and its relationship to culture and society and has exhibited her art at nearly 20 solo exhibitions. It is my honor to welcome our next keynote speaker, Diana Cohen. Hi, you guys. Um, what a total honor to be here talking, speaking with you all and also to get to hear the people who have spoken before me. Um, I am not a scientist. I feel like that's important to say here. I, my background is as a visual artist, so um, I'll just preface that by saying the artwork I've been making for almost 30 years is made out of plastic bags that I cut up and sew back together. And I show my pieces in galleries and foundations and museums. Um, I'm in a show that's traveling right now that just opened at Reed College at their museum that's called Plastic Entanglements. Uh, but it originated from Penn State, from the Palmer Museum there. So I'm a big fan of using art and film and music and uh, all different kinds of communication devices to talk to people and help share information, a lot of which is obviously coming from science and scientific research and design and innovation. So. Again, it's a really big honor to be here. And I, uh, in lieu of a PowerPoint, I brought some short video pieces with me that I think, in terms of imagery-wise, communicate a lot more than I could tell you in the amount of time that I have to talk to you today. So uh, I want to start out just by showing you the first one, which is called Open Your Eyes. And then I'll speak in between. So I hope that you'll enjoy this short piece. Open your eyes. When did we become a plastic society? We got plastic bags, <laughs> plastic water bottles, plastic straws, plastic cups, plastic wrap, plastic utensils, and plastic to-go containers. Plastic is a substance the Earth cannot digest. And every bit of plastic that has ever been created still exists. Every day in the United States, we throw out almost 88,000 tons of plastic. Now, what happens to plastic after you use it? Well, most of it goes into landfills. A portion gets into the water course and eventually ends up in the oceans. Recycling is not a sustainable solution. It's actually called downcycling because plastic never goes away. Consumption of disposable plastics has spiraled out of control. What is the number one thing plastic is made out of? Well, every year, we use 17 million barrels of oil to make plastic water bottles. This is enough to fuel one million cars every year. Plastic pieces on the ocean surface now outnumber sea life six to one. Plastic makes up almost 90% of all trash floating on the ocean surface. 46,000 pieces of plastic per square mile. What effect does plastic have on human health? Plastic chemicals like BPA are absorbed by the body. 
studies show that they alter hormones and disrupt the endocrine system. By refusing disposable plastic, you can improve the health of the ocean and the environment around us, including human health and animal health. Since 2009, Plastic Pollution Coalition has been building a global alliance to combat single-use disposable plastic. Our membership includes individuals, organizations, NGOs, businesses, campuses, and policymakers. We share resources, tools, and messaging with our coalition to develop a broad-based strategy to tackle the issue head on. We're working with universities, businesses, festivals, musicians, and more to create replicable and sustainable approaches to eliminating single-use disposable plastic. Plastic pollution is a global problem that humans alone have caused. We can do something about it. Please join our coalition. For more information, visit www.plasticpollutioncoalition.org. Remember, bring reusable items with you, like a water bottle, a cup, a bag, utensils. Refuse plastic when it's offered. And remember to say, no straw, please. Only purchase items in sustainable packaging, like glass and wax paper. Um, so, you know, I've been taking notes while everyone else was speaking today, and I was, I'm really looking for where I can have the most value add into the conversation that we're having today and tomorrow with a focus towards water. And I feel like it's important to mention that, I mean, we created Plastic Pollution Coalition, was a small group of people literally 10 years ago. We just had our 10 year anniversary on October 24th. And we launched in 2009. It was the same day that Bill McKibbins launched 350.org. So we had a small lunch with about 40 people in Malibu on the beach. It was hosted by Leonardo DiCaprio's mom because she was really concerned about all the plastic she was picking up every day when she went for a walk on the beach with her dog. Um, and instead of holding a sign that said Plastic Pollution Coalition that day, we held a sign that said 350.org. And we took a group photograph and we sent it in to be part of the 350.org movement. And we really didn't know when we started out that plastic and plastic pollution would become such a core issue to, I think it's one of the central issues of our time right now. I, um, again, I came to it as an artist who had been using the material and watching some of my pieces, some of the bags and some of my pieces begin to fissure and break apart. And I was interested in that, and I thought that it might mean that the plastic was organic and ephemeral like us. So um, in exploring that, I realized that's not what was happening. And then also having grown up in Southern California on the Pacific Ocean, um, I started surfing when I was 30. When I was 25, I got certified as a diver. I just kept seeing more and more plastic in the ocean over the course of my life. Um, and my first reaction to that was really that I wanted to go clean it up. I heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I'm assuming everyone here has heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, have you? Yeah. Well, has it, have you all? How many people have heard of it? OK, great. It's most of the audience. So um, so I had heard of that. And you know, I wanted to go out and clean it up. And I started talking to people like Captain Charles Moore, who founded Algalita, and to Marcus Erickson, who's been cited in some of the reports today with Jana Janbeck's work. And these people are all have, we've all grown to become colleagues with each other as we have learned together about the issue. Um, and it's not something that I really thought would have the kind of tentacles and ramifications that it has. But as I've continued to learn more about it, I, I see that it does. And um, when we created the coalition, we had two goals. Our two initial goals were if 80, 70 to 80, 90% actually of the marine debris that we were finding and that NOAA was finding and Ocean Conservancy and their beach cleanups, if that was plastic, then we needed to change what, the way we talked about it. We needed to call it what it is. If 70 to 90% of what we're finding is plastic, then we need to call it plastic. When it gets into the environment, into our waterways, our lakes, the ocean, into, into nature, basically, it is plastic pollution. Um, 
And then we also talked about what we could do and how we could help empower people right away, and even really young people, to, to take action in a positive way that would help reduce their exposure to plastic and help us create less of this plastic pollution. And that was to encourage people. We took the 3R model that we teach our kids, reduce, reuse, recycle, and we added a fourth R to the front, which is refuse. So we asked people whenever possible to refuse single-use plastic. In support of that, and I have more in my bag, I brought food-grade stainless steel straws for anyone who doesn't have one already, please help yourself afterwards. Um, I also brought information with me because in the last 10 years, many of the projects that we've worked on have included looking at the health impact. And although some would say there's not enough information about it, I think that the information is very, very sobering. In fact, what Seth spoke about earlier in terms of a reduction in sperm count and sperm mobility is really disconcerting. So. Uh, I'm going to talk for a minute just about what I've learned about the health impact, and this is mainly based on studies of BPA and phthalates, which are the two main chemical groups. Well, not BPA, but bisphenols and phthalates are two of the main chemical groups that are used to make the plastic and a lot of the plastic packaging that we use for food and beverage and some beauty products and medical products. But um, in the studies of particularly BPA and, again, phthalates, they have been identified as being endocrine disruptors, which means that they affect our endocrine system, and in some cases, in, in, in a sense, they function like synthetic estrogen. And I just want to tell you guys why this is really personal for me, too. When I was a teenager, preteen, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and we were told that it was estrogen receptive, which, when you're 13, doesn't mean anything to you. So she died four years later. She died when I was 17. And um, she died, uh, you know, without us, again, understanding really what that meant. But we now know that 80% of breast cancers are estrogen receptive. So let's just go backwards for a second. If we're eating and drinking, if we're packaging almost all of our food and beverages in plastics, then we are potentially, potentially micro amounts of the chemicals in those plastics are leaching into our food and beverage, and they are impacting our health. So I'm going to come back to... BPA has probably been studied the most. I know I noticed some people here have um, plastic bottles. I would assume they have plastic bottles that say that they're BPA free. Uh, I've met several times with Dr. Califat, Antonia Califat. She runs the endocrine disruption department at the CDC in Atlanta. And she has told me point blank that the substitutes for BPA, which could be, I don't know, BPB, BPC, BPS, BPZ, are equally bad, if not worse, to BPA. And the last time I was there, she scared the bejesus out of me talking about high levels of BPA in adult diapers, which, you know, the skin, our skin is the largest organ of our body. We absorb things through our skin. So um, very sobering information. But again, BPA, which has probably been studied the most in, a, in uh, adults, has been linked to lower sexual function, sterility, and infertility. It's been linked to obesity and diabetes, of which we're having epidemics of in the United States right now, um, and, and generously exporting to other countries. Um, and it's been linked to breast cancer, brain cancer, and prostate cancer. And then babies exposed to these chemicals in utero, so through umbilical cord blood, it's been linked to shortened anal, shorten anal genital distance in male babies, smaller penis size, feminization of boys, early menses and girls, uh, attention deficit disorder, and lower IQ. So what I just want to say for a second is like even one or two of these things to me is totally alarming. And I am waiting for the world to wake up and say, you know what, like we've had enough. Uh, it's, again, I'm going to bring us back just to plastic pollution as an issue, is something that Seth touched on this morning in the beginning, which is that plastic disproportionately impacts lower income communities around the world and across the United States. For, literally from extraction of petrochemical, uh, you know, of oil and petrochemical chemicals uh, and war through manufacturing and transportation, through production, through use when it's single use, we're using it for a very short amount of time and it's instantly a waste management issue. And a lot of the solutions and uh, industry solutions for that are, are different forms of burning. So dumping, burying in our environment, which 
people euphemistically call landfilling, dumping into our waterways and our oceans, rivers. I've been to many places around the world where they don't have any infrastructure or frankly places in the United States that don't have infrastructure to support managing these resources. They're really not waste, they're materials and resources. Uh, and when you look at lower income communities are usually located, if you go to the Gulf Coast in Houston, they're located across the street from the petrochemical plant, from 66 miles of petrochemical plants. And people have higher levels of asthma and all different kinds of health issues because they live near the places that it's being processed, manufactured, produced, or burnt, which you know may be called waste to energy or it may be called pyrolysis. It may ha it goes under different, there's different terminology used for it. Some of it sounds really good you know, waste to oil. We're turning plastic back into oil so we can burn it. I mean, it's all about burning it. So um, I feel like it's really important to say that. And then I also wanted to address what we spoke about earlier in terms of recycling and recycling rates. Um, there's something that's called the China Sword. It took place in 2017. Uh, and it's when China basically said, we don't want to take back any of your cargo containers. Hi, US, stop sending us your plastic uh, to recycle. And when China did that with the China sword, our recycling rates for plastic, which were already less than 9% in the United States, and this includes polystyrene, et cetera, uh, dropped the projection by a chemical engineer who works with us, uh, Jan Dell, was that by the end of 2018, the recycling rates in the US would drop to 4.4%, and by the end of this year, 2019, they will drop to 2.6%. So if our recycling rates for plastics are 2.6%, is that an effective system? Right. So with that, happy news. Uh, I'm gonna share another short video piece that we made. It was an expedition we did uh, from Bali to Komodo a couple years ago in Indonesia, looking at the impact of plastic pollution on ecotourism there. Daring to see a very beautiful fish swimming alongside a bag of plastic and that's something that will stick in my mind for a long time. I'm struck here by what we're seeing. There wasn't a single place that we went that wasn't filled with plastic debris. I've been a guide in Indonesia, all over Indonesia, since last 20 years. And then I can see a lot of change now, a lot of plastic just floating around the sea. As hard as it is to see the amount of plastic pollution that's hitting this most beautiful spot I've ever seen on the planet, I am so hopeful and motivated to do more. Uh, walking with the tourism, they start talking about plastic, that uh, it is dirty. And also I read some uh, description about the dangers of the plastic. We cannot wait any longer. The problem is urgent. We need to address it now. Otherwise, it's going to affect not just our marine biodiversity, our coastal communities, but the economy as well that depends on uh, the tourism a lot. I think that the ocean is communicating with us through the plastic, the materials of our own making, because it's something that humans can understand. 
Well, I came down here actually to take a water sample to look for microplastics in the water. I just was stopped because as you can see, this is a wall of so much trash. I mean, it goes 10 feet deep here. A lot of it's photodegraded. You go to pick it up and it just shatters. And that's almost instant microplastics. So I'm feeling a little overwhelmed by the quantity of trash. I don't even know where to begin. I mean, you can't even start to think about cleaning this sort of thing up as an individual. We filled up tons of bags and we still couldn't collect all of it. It was just kept on coming and coming and coming. And it made me realize we can't solve this problem by collecting all the plastic that's in the oceans. We need to stop it at the source. Let's not use single-use plastic. That would be, right there, would be such a difference that we could make. That's really, really breaking my heart because my daughter, she started diving. And I'm worried about that maybe on a couple of years later, she's not going to see that kind of things that I've ever seen before. We, we in the Western world, we say, throw it away. There is no away. It goes somewhere, and this is where it's going. We were able to talk about plastic pollution that was on the beach, and even hand out metal straws demonstrated that by sipping out of the natural spring there to get uh, fresh water. Thank you for your hard work. No, it's not hard work. It's kind of my happiness. Gives you energy. I'm happy to do that. Not hard work. A really important value, value, which is spirituality. There's magic happening every day in, in, in the universe and nature. We're at a point in our evolution where we're moving into a new phase. We are in a transformational moment. So we have the opportunity right now to make changes, even little by little, day by day, that are gonna spread like wildfire. They're gonna change the face of humanity, and we are just in time to make this change happen, and I know that this is what we need to do. There's a statement at the end of that. It's online on our website in case anybody wants to see it. But we all, we all, all the different groups that were involved in that expedition came together and agreed on a kind of consensus statement based on what we had experienced together. So um, I want to come back around also to some things that were spoken about earlier in terms of, uh, again, Jenna Jambach's work showing the leakage. I don't like that word, leakage points. Um, I don't like the word leakage because it sounds just like a spill. And uh, I think that we have, when you look at the ramp up right now of the petrochemical industry and the plastic industry to produce new plastics with frackers and ethylene crackers in central Pennsylvania, the Ohio River Valley on the Gulf Coast, we are gearing up to produce like four times as much plastic right now. And I know that most of the plastic I think half of the plastic on Earth has been produced in the last 15 years. So um, there's a big gear up right now. If anybody's working in that industry in the room, I'm sure you can speak to that. Um, but there's a big ramp up right now of production. A lot of it is to produce single-use plastic water bottles. Um, and that is taking place right now. And I think an important thing to acknowledge about the leakage points mainly being China and Southeast Asia, in the data that came out of Jenna Jambach's report. Um, the main thing to mention there is that when we do audits, brand audits, of what is found now at beach cleanups, which we've been doing for the last three years, the results are actually very different from placing blame on Southeast Asia and the Global South and, and China. Uh, what you see actually is that the top companies that have made the packaging that is washing up and is being picked up in cleanups are all US and European companies. Um, it's Coke, Pepsi, Nestle's, Unilever, Procter & Gamble. I stood on the beach in Manila at a place called Freedom Island about three years ago where there was an ongoing, very labor-intensive cleanup happening with between 10 or 20 different uh, NGO groups. 
and they had just begun to track the brand information. And when I asked what they were seeing so far in their data, they said that they saw that uh, Nestle's and Unilever were the two largest polluters in terms of the materials that were being found. Um, and so I shared that with a friend who shared it with Paul at Unilever, and Unilever has begun to step up and try and take steps to change. Um, what I wanna say about that is we're all in this together, <laughs> and it is gonna take industry changing to change this, but I think you're gonna see more and more pressure come from uh, grassroots citizens, communities, frontline communities, and the public, because as the public continues to learn more about this issue, I don't think they're gonna be very happy. I'm, I'm deeply unhappy about it, and I, of course, I'm disappointed with um, my own governmental agencies here in the United States and their ability or non-ability to uh, oversee toxic chemicals or update TOSCA or any of the things that need to happen that would help protect all of us, frankly, so, and our children and unborn generations, hopefully, to come. So um, I wanted to share a couple other things with you guys. There's a a better alternatives list we worked on with 11 different coalition members. Um, we now are just 1,200 groups around the world, again, from 60 different countries on six continents, all working on different aspects of this issue. When we first created the coalition the second year, I received an email from the Girl Scouts of America and the Teamsters the same day asking to join our coalition. So there are a lot of people working on this issue, and many of them are working on cleanup and different kinds of gadgets and devices and technology that I would say focus on downstream solutions. But uh, I would like to use this opportunity to challenge anyone at MIT or engineers in the room to really begin to, to gaze upstream and look at all the different pressure points where you could be of service in the work that you do in terms of creating uh, gadgets, technology, um, systems that would support um, basically a world free of plastic pollution. So as we move away from these kind of materials, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, because I've been making artwork out of plastic for, like I said, almost 30 years, so I have this total love-hate relationship with the material. I think it's an amazing material. And uh, it's definitely been used, I think, for a lot of good things. Um, but I think at some point there was a fork in the road. <laughs> there was an opportunity to use it to make single-use things and throw away, this kind of throwaway lifestyle. And that was really sold to us through marketing and advertising as something that was gonna set housewives free, give us more time, time to go out in the world and have a career, I don't know, do something. And, uh, and I think, unfortunately, uh, what's happened there is that it's created all these um, unintended consequences. I don't think we realized what it was gonna do to our health. It just, every once in a while, I'll be somewhere, and I, like, I'll be at a, like, a museum gift shop, and I'll see a rainbow stack of nesting bowls you know, and they're so beautiful, they're really beautifully designed and they're all nestled inside of each other and I'll just be like, ooh. I'll go over to them and start looking at them and then I'll, go, I'll snap out of it and go like, oh my God, what am I doing? But I mean, the colors are so beautiful and you can, you can, kinda, you can kinda make plastic do anything, which is really cool. But at the same time, you know, if we're designing for single use, I think that that is a, an irresponsible use of a valuable material. And Paul Conant, who's considered one of the fathers of the international zero waste movement, said to me in Puerto Rico a few years ago, uh, the best thing we could do with plastic would be to design with it to things that we wanna use for a long time and then have a system where we can take it back and use it again or break it down and use it again. And I say I agree with him as long as it's non-toxic and bio-benign. So we have a lot of work to do to figure that out. Um, yeah, we have a lot of work to do. I wanted to mention one of the projects that we've worked on with Child Health and Development and a couple other coalition members in um, 
in the East Bay in California. It's a project called Rethink Plastic. I brought some of these too, if anyone's interested. Um, it was a project where we worked with a small cohort in the East Bay, mainly lower income community. And they um, designed these methods with us to suggest how to shop, cook, serve food, and store food with no plastic. And they agreed to allow uh, Child Health and Development to do blood draws, both at the beginning of the project and then after they'd followed this protocol for a certain length of time. And what we saw just in the preliminary pilot for this is that the levels of chemicals from plastic dropped in everyone's bloodstream. So it is possible with a lot of chemicals that are associated with plastic to, to pee them out or detox them out of our bodies. And I think that that's incredibly promising. We have um, nurses and different programs uh, in the Philippines and in Singapore and uh, in Israel who are looking at just implementing this information into projects that they're already doing or doing expanded studies there as well. So I think that that's very exciting. Um, I would say to anybody who's doing any kind of cleanup that if you are interested in adding that brand audit component to what you're doing, it's very easy to find. You can find it. We created a movement called Break Free From Plastic and you can find it at the Break Free From Plastic website or on our website, which is plasticpollutioncoalition.org. It's also free to join our coalition, so I humbly invite everyone in this room to please join us before it's not free anymore, which might be next year, um, now that we're 10 years old. Um, and I'm trying to think if there was anything else I really wanted to share with you guys. I, I wanted to let you know that I know that this is a huge challenge and um, I don't know why I wake up every day really excited and enthusiastic. I think it might be because last year, um, I think it was uh, plastic, straw bands was like one of the number one things that came up on food, in, within food, food uh, communications. And some of the top words of last year were toxic and plastic straw. So I think that might be why I feel like we have passed a tipping point where the public is becoming more aware of this. Um, and it makes me feel incredibly hopeful and uh, enthusiastic. And I also feel right now like it's the wild, wild west in terms of coming up with innovation solutions or existing alternate alternative materials that we could be using instead, but really helping people bring those to market, scale them up, et cetera. I just feel like there are some people who are gonna make really a lot of money here when they come up with alternate solutions that again are non-toxic and bio-benign so that don't have the, the uh, unforeseen problems that Seth mentioned when it comes to implementing something like lead or <laughs> other materials. Um, I'm a really big fan of glass. It's this new old thing called glass. I like storing food in glass. I like using ceramics at home. Um, ceramics, glass. I really like food grade stainless steel a lot. I like bento boxes made out of that. Um, I like carrying my steel uh, cup. And yesterday at Boston College, I got 10 cents off my coffee because I had that. I don't think that the big coffee uh, Companies advertise it, and I'm not sure why. I think the first one that does is going to engender a lot of um, customer loyalty for that. But I happen to know that Starbucks, Coffee Bean, and Pete's all give either Starbucks gives 10 cents off, Coffee Bean gives 20 cents off, uh, Pete's, I can't remember, it might be 10 cents. Uh, if you come in with your own reusable cup, obviously, I think they prefer if it's clean when you come in with it. <laughs> but you know, if I were a student right now, that's something I would just be carrying with me religiously every day because, um, because I wanna save money because I'm a student. Or I just, I like saving money actually. I found when I drive between Los Angeles and the Bay Area, um, AM, PM, Mini Marts. I don't know if you guys have those on the East Coast, but it's this chain called, it's like a gas station and a little shop. I found that if I walk in with my own reusable cup and say, hi, what can I buy that I can just put in my own cup? 
and then I buy something, when they charge me, they, I, I ask them if they would have charged me differently if I didn't have my own cup. And I've found most of the time that they say, I'm going to charge you for a refill. That'll be 99 cents. What would it have been if I didn't bring my own cup? And they say $1.99. So again, I care about things like this. I also bring my own bag. Simple concept. Um, we've seen a lot of traction with straws. And California, I think, is doing pretty well there in terms of we passed um, legislation that is was copying our, our drought-based water only upon request, which is straws only upon request. And uh, that's been implemented now and is going really well. So um, I say all of that to you knowing that we're going to have another conversation. Is it later today or tomorrow? Tomorrow. Yeah, is that today? Oh, tomorrow we're going to have a conversation about policy, so I'll look forward to speaking with you more then. And I have one more short film that I would like to share, just for fun. Um, oh, let's share Refill Revolution. So this is a pilot project that we launched with a big music festival in um, Tennessee that's called Bonnaroo, and it's a model that we helped create that has now is now being implemented by other um, other music festivals and outdoor events. Which one? Sorry. Refill Revolution. This one here? Mm -hmm. We are here to talk about the Refill Revolution. It's our 15th festival. And thanks to PPC and Steely's, we are diverting lots and lots of single-use items from the landfill. It's amazing just to see the difference in just three years. People are, you know, just organically going for the reusable option. So I think it's just proof, and I think what the Refill Revolution really is about is just giving people the option, because if you do, they're going to make the right decision. Single-use plastic being discarded on Earth is taking a devastating toll on our environment. Disposable containers such as plastic cups, straws, and water bottles are a huge part of the problem. And here at Bonnaroo, we're working on a new approach. Bonnaroo brands and provides stainless steel cups, which they sell to festival goers. And the just normal festival attendees can get a dollar off every beer if they refill, as opposed to get a, getting a plastic cup. And we are now in the third year. Every year has had its own branded cup color. Uh, the first year was green, the second year was blue, and the third year is now purple. Really, one of the things we're trying to do here is to rethink the disposal mindset of our culture. Plastic Pollution Coalition Refill Revolution. The Refill Revolution is a movement, and it's a movement to reduce our plastic footprint on this planet. One of my dreams for music festivals and outdoor events is to be able to go to one that is actually a zero waste event. Buy those steel cups, use these steel cups this weekend, and you know, keep that plastic out of the fills, right? Refill revolution. Supporting the Refill Revolution. Join the Refill Revolution. We're spreading the word about the Refill Revolution. We are saying no to plastic pollution. We're getting our supplies all stocked up, We're getting our cups so ready to rock. Today we're finishing it here at Bonnaroo 2016, supporting the Refill Revolution. I think the dream is that people, you know, take what they learn here and bring it home with them and, and really live their lives differently. Right now we're kind of, you know, on a path towards hopefully going plastic free. It's a long road, but I have a lot of confidence that uh, not only can this festival get there, but many events all over the world can get there. And I think the impact of that on the sort of daily lives of people is going to be significant. Okay. Um, 
I know that just looks like a lot of fun. It's really hard, though. I don't know if anyone's ever gone to a music festival before. It's like four days of people camping. <laughs> it's, uh, and it can be really hot, not to complain or anything. The music's great. Um, I want to just wrap up my presentation by saying to you, I'm very much focused on positive solutions and alternatives to single-use plastic. And I also want to offer the fact that we have wonderful content and information on our website, everything from both of the CL reports, plastic and climate change and plastic and health, to uh, our healthy baby guide, which is really a plastic free baby guide and all different kinds of stuff like that, that people are welcome to download for free and uh, use and gain information from. And I hope that, uh, I hope that we can help inspire you guys to move towards a world free of plastic pollution. So thank you.